I'm Joe Jasinski, and uh, I'm a Python Django web developer at Imaginary Landscape, as you just heard. And I'm doing, uh, as I'm doing Django all day, I finally uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, MongoDB a bit, and uh, in particular, Mongo Engine. I've used it before, but uh, I had an opportunity to work with a larger project for it. So I'm kind of excited to share with you some stuff that I've learned and uh, some basic tutorial on what it is and um, how to get started using it. So first of all, uh, what is MongoDB? And it's a NoSQL document-based database, which is basically um, just a very unstructured uh, bunch of collections. Like um, if you wanted to collect data on Jay Leno's car collection, he, he has all sorts of different cars, all sorts of different properties on those cars. Some have engines, or some don't, maybe. Some, have, some are 3D printed, some, are, uh, some use um, gasoline, and some are electric. So collections are just kind of like a loosely bundled, um, loosely bundled data kind of loosely tied together, um, and which is the foundation of MongoDB. And MongoDB uses a JavaScript type syntax for interacting with it, and it's very flexible in terms of how you store your data. So just from a high level, roughly speaking, uh, once you put some data in MongoDB to, you know, you, uh, you query it, you issue a query, and you get a response and a JSON response. And there's um, some th unique things to note about the response. There's an ID field, which is automatically generated by MongoDB, and I just made something up here. And then this all is dynamic stuff. Uh, this is a JSON response with, um, you know, a, uh, with data structured the way you want it to be structured. And you notice between uh, the records or the documents, there's no consistency. You could have uh, some fields that are there, some fields that are, aren't, some fields that are lists, some that are, some that are dictionaries. Um, so it's for highly unstructured data and, um, uh, yeah. So some example uses of MongoDB. Uh, if you have some forms, like a dynamic forms that you want to generate on a website for like a form builder tool, uh, MongoDB might be a good application for accepting uh, form data and for creating forms. For dynamic logging, kind of time series data where um, each, um, each record, <coughs> each or document would be a, um, a point in time. And kind of similarly for graphs and for content management systems, uh, for system configuration management, um, situations where you don't have a stable schema and something where you need to do a lot of writes. Uh, one example, when I was, uh, I was doing some scraping uh, a while back with some friends, and um, a lot, we were scraping recipes, and recipes on websites are pretty dynamic things. And instead of having, designing like a big database schema around that, we used Mongo to just uh, store that data loosely. So when not to use it, uh, basically when you have transactions, um, when you need to ensure that something happened um, atomically or consistently and atomically, the, uh, this is not a tool you want to use for banking systems or um, money management systems. And um, when you have a lot of relationships between data, you're, probably MongoDB isn't the best choice. MongoDB is good for things that are kind of st like a document, um, just a single thing. Um, that's stored and um, not really related to anything else, or can be loosely related, but uh, you don't have joins. Um, so, uh, yeah. So some basic terms, we already talked about a collection, and that's basically like a, uh, a container or like a bucket for storing similar data. It's like a table in SQL, but very dynamic. And a document is similar to a record, and um, a single item that you get from uh, a search result. Uh, oops. It's my first time using uh, Jupyter for doing a presentation. So how do you install MongoDB? Well, app get install Mongo is a nice one if you're Ubuntu. Also, they have some really good, uh, if you want the latest, greatest version, you can get it on their website. They have installation instructions for all the major operating system. Or I created a little Docker script. You can just, uh, with this, simply uh, run the script, it will download the, um, the, the Docker image and, and execute it, and you can connect to it from, or to port uh, 27 or 27.0.17. 
So once you have it, once you have the server up and running, you can you can install the client tools, which um, the the core one is the Mongo command line uh, client. And if you type Mongo in a shell, you get to the Mongo shell. If you want to see the current list of databases, you just type the db command. Uh, or if you want to show all the databases, you can type uh, the dbs or databases command. Uh, if you want to use a specific database, uh, you can switch to it using the use command. Very similar to MySQL. Um, also, um, if you just want to like create a database, you can just use give it a name and it will create it. Or basically, it, it creates it the first time you insert something into it. Um, you can drop a database using this. You can show the collections within. Once you've um, selected a database, you can list the collections. And um, here's some commands to get some basic size totals. Um, this is all JavaScript, or at least a lot of this is based off of JavaScript. So um, you know, it's. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. This is a, a Django Python talk, but it's very powerful um, if you're a JavaScript coder. And um, but we're we like Python, so we have our Python wrapper tools for it. And <coughs> two is uh, PyMongo and Mongo Engine. And PyMongo is a lightweight wrapper around um, MongoDB syntax. It's very um, J JavaScript-like. So um, uh, you know, when you're interacting, with it, if you look at the syntax, you'll see a lot of things that are familiar with the raw queries that you're making in JavaScript. Um, it's used by a lot of other packages, including Mongo Engine. And to get started with that, <coughs> you can uh, just do a simple connection here. Um, you instantiate the client, and if you just all, all it takes to connect to your local host on the default port is um, creating the class, instantiating the class, and um, you can pass a lot of different connection parameters to suit your different connection needs. Like if you have usernames and passwords, there's connection strings you can generate to, to connect. Uh, to access a um, uh, to access a database, um, you can just uh, call the attribute on the client or access it like a dictionary. And uh, if you store it, you can save it to the DB object here. And then once you have the DB object, you can list or you can access a collection by um, this syntax here. So uh, let's cre let's create some records and. Um, here I'm just defining two dictionaries with some sub lists for my collection of DVDs, and um, all you need to need to do to <coughs> to insert them is just uh, you have defined your collection from above here. Uh, you just need to run insert one and pass it in the document, and then uh, you can get the ID back of the of the automatically generated ID that Mongo created for you. So that's what this inserted ID does. And so it saves it here, and you can see um, it came back with a result. If you want to find a single match, this will find basically um, the first document that matches this criteria. So it finds the first um, document that it f with the type equals movie. Or if you do find, uh, it will list everything that matches that criteria. So um, everything where type equals movie. In this case, there's only two records, but here you can do a count command, very basic. Um, you can update. You're basically providing the search criteria. And then this special Mongo syntax set, and you're telling which field to set. And in this case, I'm even uh, creating a field called test, and I'm setting the capital test to that field. So it's very you can create fields on the fly with this. It's cool, but it's scary, too. Um, here's another example of a find. You can delete um, everything by this command here. I don't want to get into Mongo Engine too much, or um, PyMongo either, too much, because uh, this talks about Mongo Engine. And um, Mongo Engine is basically an ORM for um, MongoDB for Python. It's very similar to Django. So if you've used that, um, it'll be very, very familiar to you. And an ORM is kind of nice. Um, so Mongo Engine is great because it gives you this flexibility, but uh, sometimes it's a little bit too much flexibility, so this will provide you a little bit of a layer to give you some control over uh, your schema, but still give you a lot of um, 
a lot of that flexibility. Let's do a quick real world example here. And I want to parse some Nginx logs. I think this would be a good use case for it. So I have um, some log data here, and I'm printing out the first record. If you're, you've probably all seen an Nginx or Apache log, but if you haven't, the IP address is first, the, the, ta the date time that it was accessed next, the, the request method and the URL that was accessed, um, the status code that it returns back, the byte size, the user agent refer is somewhere in there. Uh, this is the referrer, I think. So um, that's we're, what we're going to use as a, an example for our um, for, for a few minutes. <laughs> so with Mongo Engine, you can connect to it very similarly to the way you do with uh, PyMongo, except the only difference is you're really passing in the database you want to connect to, whereas PyMongo you had to navigate to that. So again, I'm connected to the local host, and I have this connection object. Now, the, the one thing I don't like about, now MongoDB gives you some options for multi, multiple database support, uh, or uh, Mongo Engine does. Um, but uh, one thing I don't quite like about it is this uh, global namespace space that when you connect, you put that at the top of your file. It's not like an, uh, an object you pass around. Um, it's, it's a little weird, but it's pretty good. That's the, um, so let's define a model. And a model is similar to a um, Jenga model, but it defines a collection instead of a table. One thing you get out of it is you can do some data validation. And um, one thing you don't get out of it is database migrations, which is kind of nice. So here's a basic Mongo engine model. Uh, it looks very familiar. Um, to Django, you're, you're inheriting from a dynamic document or a document class. And um, you can see there's different field types, such as a string field. We've set this one to require the date time, uh, which is required, the URL, um, an, an integer field for status code, the method adheres to or enforces the choices um, up here. So uh, you can only store those choices. Uh, an integer um, field for the byte sent with a min value of zero. A string field, and here's the unique thing, is the list field. You can have a list of strings, for example. And now this doesn't really fit into the um, Apache log parsing, but I just put it in there so we can kind of um, experiment with it a little bit. So um, uh, you can, uh, right here I'm just showing, uh, you can query the list of, of log files uh, by just running this log.objects. And I'm just showing there's um, nothing in it right now. And to create a, a log file entry, uh, it's very similar to Django. You're creating a class. You're setting up various um, attributes to pass in, like the date, you're setting a date time for the date and time, the URL, the status code. Um, and here I'm passing in a list of tags. And that's a little different that, um, from how we usually do it. Uh, Django doesn't permit that. Well, with HStore it does, but for the most case, traditional databases don't allow you to put lists into the database. Uh, so just like Django, you can set the user, or you could set attributes on the class directly, or you could set it as part of the constructor. And then when you hit save, it creates that log object. So here I'm listing um, the log objects. These, these syntaxes are, are equivalent. And this is returning a query set of log objects um, just like Django. I can count it, and the count, I could do a count operation in these two different ways, or also equivalent, and I can delete. So I created a little script here to parse out just a chunk of log data, and I'm not going to get too deep into it, but just know that here's a regular expression that's going to run through this, this log file. It's going to do a match. Uh, I'm going to create some tags depending on the byte size. Um, if it's very small, I'll, um, I'll tag it with very small or small or medium. The date, I'm going to convert to a um, uh, date time from a string using NGINX's weird uh, date format. And I'm going to save it just like I was doing before. I'm passing, in all the, passing the dictionary into the constructor and saving it. So um, now I can query it, and I get you know, a list of, in this case, like 3,500 results, and it's truncated just to prevent, um, you know, DDoSing your terminal. So, uh, um, just like Django, I can access 
um, a single result by um, giving the uh, the index of the list that's the query set that's returned, and I can call each attribute, such as uh, you know here's you know, the various attributes on the file. Just like Django, you can also filter. So in this case, I'm filtering based on a URL that's uh, equal to root, and I can count the results. And I can also slice um, the query set, so I can return the, the last five results, uh, or I could slice um, between two and five results, or like the first uh, results, uh, I think two through four, or two through five. I'm not sure if it's doing like a like a limit, like you're talking about it. It might it might be doing the full query and limiting it, but I I have to check. I, this was the syntax that Mongo Engine provided, so they might have optimized it, um, but I'm not I'm not sure. Okay. So here is an example of um, you can use different operators just like you can in Django, so um, I can filter the URL with anything that contains about and count the results. Um, there's a bunch of different operators, and I listed a few here, but there's many more. Um, so I can, the IP address starts with 12. The I stands for case insensitive. And I can also do filters based on numeric data and date times. So I can look for a filter based on anything that's greater than um, August 8th or um, August 30th. Uh, or I can uh, filter for anything whose uh, byte sense is greater than zero or not equal to zero. And there's a whole bunch of different operators you can use too. Also, one thing you don't get in a traditional ORM is, or in Django without HStore is this, uh, you can filter on the list field, so I can say in the tags field, I, I want to return all results that contain a list item of small size. Um, these are equivalent here. Or you could say I want to return anything with small size or very small size. There's also an operator that lets you do it for and, so um, I want to return only results that have a list in my tags, small size and very small size. Um, I didn't list that, but that's in the docs. You can order by um, by IP address, for example. You can select distinct values, so I can um, uh, filter, you know, filter the results and only return unique values based on this um, the field specification here. Uh, similar to Django, you have um, uh, logical operators. So um, by default, if you specify two queries or two um, uh, conditions in here, it will uh, op, uh, issue an and. It will and them together, so anything that, any URL that contains about and any date time that's less than or equal to 8.30. Um, this is an equivalent syntax right here. Um, you'll notice um, Django has this thing called the queue operator, which lets you kind of group uh, conditions, uh, mainly for the or clause. So here's an example of using the, the queue um, Q function to look for anything where the URL is contains or is is equal to about or the URL is um, root. You could do some basic aggregations uh, like average and sum, and um, similarly you can apply a filter to uh, those aggregations. So I can filter IP addresses and, and sum the bytes. And uh, now this, this here is a little bit more of a powerful feature but of Mongo Engine, but you're kind of relying on the, the basics, or like PyMongo and MongoDB itself. You're kind of falling back to its syntax to get when you want to get a little bit more um, powerful. So in this case, I want to count the, UR, count the URLs um, made, or uh, count the requests made by each of these uh, IP addresses. So this is, it takes advantage of something called pipelines. And uh, again, this is a feature that, this was really hard to find any information about in Mongo Engine. The, the documentation really didn't exist. Uh, and I had to um, look at Mongo Engine's documents, talks. I had to look at uh, 
PyMongo's docs and MongoDB's docs and look at the source code to kind of try to figure out what was going on here. <laughs> um, but the pipeline, it's a, it's a common thing in MongoDB itself. Uh, it lets you specify different um, kind of like funnels for your data to go through as it's being transformed to give you like an output result. And this is very similar to doing a SQL group by. Um, I'm grouping, I'm grouping, doing my group by here. Then I'm sorting by the, uh, the count URL, which is a derived field. And then I'm matching for the count, you know, URL count that was greater than, um, greater than three, just so I could kind of prune out the results. Um, similarly, I did something very so, uh, similar to find like the total bytes made by each of these uh, URLs and um, uh, kind of a similar syntax. Sorry, it's um, kind of spread out here. But uh, um, again, I'm, I'm doing a sum on the bytes, and I'm sorting, and I'm uh, filtering for anything that's larger than uh, 5,000 bytes. So uh, one thing and I mentioned before, you don't have transactions in MongoDB. So you have to rely on doing everything atomically and because you don't want to have race conditions where uh, you have someone, two, two processes that are running simultaneously read something, uh, read, and then um, let's say you have two processes that are trying to read and update a, uh, um, a particular document. Uh, well, it, if they're running at the same time, you're not, you don't necessarily have any guarantees with MongoDB as to which one is going to finish uh, you know, finish its operation first. Uh, so uh, one way you can get around that a little bit is with some atomic updates, meaning it will do two operations at once. For example, uh, let's see. Oh, here's, here I'm just creating a new document. Um, here's an example of a not atomic uh, update. I'm querying a document, so I'm getting the log object. I'm updating it, and then I'm saving it. So there's um, two queries are happening, a search and then an update. But with an atomic update, you can do all, all of that in one step. So I can um, search and then update one and then set, uh, set my new field, my user agent field to be uh, Firefox in this example. And it returns, back to you the, it returns back to you the count of objects updated. Another example of an atomic update, um, here's one. I'm doing basically the same thing as the above except um, I'm updating all documents that match this criteria instead of just one. Um, so you can also atomically update uh, list fields. So in our tags field, I can search for anything where the URL is about, and then I can add to um, the set. I can add um, about to that set of tags. Um, same same example here, basically. Yeah. Oh. I think. Uh, I think it. I think it does document level locking. So I, I, as you're updating it, I think it's just going to um, do one document at a time. Uh, and I know it's, it's kind of the same thing where um, writers block, wait, was it? Writers block writers and uh, readers don't block at all. Uh, I, I read about this. I can't remember the exact yeah, order. I think, but. I think that's right, that uh, other writers will be blocked, but readers will not be blocked. Okay. It's not going to lock your whole database when that's you're doing right. a, a write. Did you have something? Uh, so I think you're going to get to the actual point I was going to bring up, but none of the things that you showed before the slide that's now on the bottom of the screen would be used a transaction for in a normal database. They're all single SQL statements. Sure. So here's another. Um, this is uh, called an upsert, uh, which is basically um, uh, if a, if a document, this is kind of similar to your update or create that is introduced in Django 1.7. Uh, it will search for um, a document that meets this criteria here. Uh, if it exists, it will 
uh, update it with this um, condition. Uh, if it does not exist, then it will create a new record with these fields plus the status code field. Um, so here's just an example of that happening. Um, uh, it's, oh, it's not really, oh, I won't walk through this, it's just too, um, I think you get the idea. Uh, here's another example of an atomic get and update. So um, this I had to fall back to using um, the kind of the raw syntax of PyMongo and MongoDB itself. So, um, let's see. If <laughs> Sorry, I, I uh, um, so basically this, oh, okay, the, the problem with this is, um, or not the problem, what I wanted to do in this case is um, update a document and return the result back. So it's like if you had, if you wanted to process a bunch of things uh, and you, uh, normally when you do an update, you'll get the count of things updated, but you won't get the object that you've updated back. So um, this is useful if you want to uh, have two processes reading from a list of things, and uh, you want to process each of those, that list of things, um, and mark them as processed, for example. Uh, that's where this comes from. So uh, you're getting it and you're updating it at the same time. So let's take a look at some of the other features of the document. Um, uh, there's just like Django, you can have mark documents as unique. Um, you can set ma max lengths for them. Uh, you can also set indexes on them to speed up their execution or multi column indexes. <coughs> um, if you do a save and you don't, um, uh, if you don't pass in valid data, you'll, it will throw an exception. Like in this case, um, I had created a document with uh, these three columns. And I'm passing in um, only one attribute that um, has one, two, three, four. When that column only takes, or when that field only takes three, so I'll get a string is too long exception, and um, I'm missing some required fields as well. Um, so uh, you can also, since I've marked IP address as um, uh, a unique field, if I try to insert two things with the same IP address, I'll get an exception. And, um, a non-unique exception. So MongoDB has some other features that are also uh, pretty useful. Um, I didn't get into these, but uh, there's dictionary fields, which you can basically attach arbitrary um, dictionaries to your, um, your object. You can have embed embedded document fields, so um, documents can, can uh, you can attach a document to a field in another document, so you can have like these nested documents. Uh, list field, map field, there's a whole bunch of more um, there's some geospatial fields. Um, it's got some good um, geospatial capabilities. You can also do document inheritance. And this is something that I found really interesting because in Django, uh, if you do model inheritance, there's a lot of inefficient queries that happen. So with a document query, uh, you're just, you know, MongoDB is kind of designed to fit this model. You can define like a product um, that inherits from document and then a book that inherits from product and a CD that inherits from product and um, you can um, store some data to it, each with their unique um, fields. And then when I query it, I'll get a book object and a CD object back. One thing that's kind of cool about um, MongoDB is it has this uh, file system built into it called uh, GFS. You can store binary files in Mongo, and um, Mongo Engine has this file field that supports that. So um, here's it's a very simple use case for um, storing in um, a file and then reading it out. You can also stream files out, so um, you don't have to read everything into memory. There's some syntax examples on, or they have some good examples on the uh, in the docs. And um, one thing that's not listed here, but you can also use MongoDB as kind of like a search index. It's got some neat um, search tools. Or Mongo Engine has a, a functionality similar to Haystack in respect. Uh, one thing that I really like about MongoDB is uh, there's a few good tools. Um, there's uh, uh, RoboMongo is my favorite graphical tool for Mongo Engine. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, 
Okay, Mongo Chef. I'll, I'll install that tonight. Anyway, here's Robo Mongo, the less interesting <laughs> option, I guess. I see. Robo Chef or Mongo Chef? Yeah, I'll spell that later. <laughs> Uh, so here, um, you can. This is this is nice. Um, it supports Mac, Windows, and Linux. So it's a, a nice basic tool for um, browsing data. And there's nothing too fancy about it. But you can, like here, I can see my collections, and um, uh, you can see the list of JSON objects that come back. Here's the the JavaScript query that uh, you have to issue, and um, You'll get these results back, and it's the stuff we were working with um, right before, right here. The tags field kind of can expand out, so you can see. Um, I guess there's nothing in that one. There are different views you can take a look at, so a table view and just the raw JSON view. And the only downside from a Python perspective is that you have to know the um, the JavaScript syntax for querying it, which is. You know, Seems a pretty seems like a pretty expressive syntax. So, uh, also, uh, just to mention, there's some good backup tools. There's um, Mongo Dump, and um, for doing some basic um, backup and restore, Mongo Dump and restore. But uh, that's kind of a high-level overview of um, Mongo Engine and MongoDB. Uh, I'm, you know, this is far from showing the complete power of it, but hopefully it's enough to kind of get started and um, give you an example of how easy it is to kind of start. Easy enough that in a Py IPython notebook I can just execute some stuff. Uh, Using the product collection. Okay. So, can't you do that in? <clears throat> it seems like that's something that you can do with normal Postgres and Django too. Is that you can just have you can the you can, but when you do like so, you can either do um, with Django uh, abstract um, base classes, which um, I think every um, table that you create inherits those attributes, but you create separate tables for that. And then you can also create like uh, non-abstract um, models, and the downside of that is you're, you're creating like let's, in this case here you have a parent model for product, and then you have these um, book and CD models that are kind of contain this uh, extra attributes, but then you have to do these big joins to. Um, I'll have to look that up again, uh, but uh, it's always, I know it's always been a performance hog when I've had things uh, in, in this situation. Yeah. I mean, you certainly can, there's like uh, polymorphic, uh, Django polymorphic, uh, which kind of does all this inheritance. It does the, um, it gives you the same effect where you can do a query and you'll get books and CDs in the same query set, uh, but it's doing it with a cost of all of joins, um, unless unless there's uh, um, some new features that I'm not aware of, uh, um, which I, there's new features all the time, so. I see, so you're... I think that Django will actually like, hide that. So you're creating a fat, a really fat... Uh, yeah, so there's, there's a bunch of empty columns and everything, but the little it's not the same like user side effect. But I, my other thing is, I think um, I did the no migrations when you change a schema. Mm -hmm. It is a super big advantage if your schema is not really long. Yeah. But it's scary if you're doing like, uh, if you need to track that stuff, you know. Yeah. But I think that maybe the array of the type is not a great example of that. I know that Postgres, at least, and I believe also Max Bell said, 
from any kind of support, from a monitor that might be short of support. So I think that's something that they would do for a long time. I think, I don't know if Django has support for that out of the box. Yeah, I know yeah. Postgres um, and MySQL have all these great features that unfortunately, as Django developers work. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, so, yeah. Well, for me, I think it's um, some of those use cases at the beginning I kind of mentioned. Um, I know there's people, there's like big flame wars and articles all over the place about people saying they used Mongo and they, they regretted it. Uh, I think you really have to choose, or be careful of uh, when to use it. Um, and I think it works best when it's, com or when it's uh, um, used in conjunction with a tr traditional database. So, uh, for, for example, Django has some great features for doing like typical database-y type things, your user models, and uh, it simplifies a lot of stuff. But then when you want to create an app or do something that has a little bit more flexibility, like create a dynamic form thing, or in the case here, which or the case that I've used it before, not this particular example, but I've used it for collecting uh, like lots and lots of log data, uh, where I just don't care about, uh, I don't care too much about consistency. I just need to grab that stuff and dump it into something um, pretty pretty quickly, and then be able to query it very conveniently and easily. So, um, you know, it's uh, I don't know if that's a great answer, but. Um, you know, I think it's best used when both things, when, with both tools together. I believe you can create um, the indexes that are nest, nest indexes. I've seen it examples in the docs for um, dictionaries. I, I wouldn't be, I'd be surprised if it also didn't work for um, list elements as well. So, um, uh, but it looked like there, they had some, in, in the MongoDB docs at least, there was a lot of um, stuff about creating indexes um, that was, looks like that was pretty powerful. So would you say you want to avoid messing too much when creating, I guess when designing your adapting to us? Not if you're not going to need to search on those skills. Oh, that's it. So, so I, I think um, at least what I've kind of figured is I've tried to keep my um, schemas fairly flat. I mean, maybe like have a dictionary uh, for some, um, you know, some, well, I mean, this is just me as a, a regular database developer moving to this. Uh, I, I typically like to have, or I'm st still having taken advantage of the full power of, of the nesting, but uh, you get, if you have nested data, you can't do relationships very well. Um, like if you have a nested um, address field or something, um, you have to have some redundant data if you want to use that address in multiple, uh, um, related to multiple documents. Um, unless you use their relationship field, there's, I think there's a, a field type um, uh, embedded, uh, I don't think I have it listed here, but there's a, a field type where you can reference a, a related document, but there's still a, a cost, a performance cost on, on that. It's not a true join. I just really liked uh, how easy it, w I really liked having an ORM that was pretty powerful, um, that was very similar to Django without having to necessarily need Django uh, to, to run it. Uh, the, w the use case I'm using this for is I'm running a celery task and I'm using Mongo engine to update Mongo and then um, as a separate project and then as a, in a Django project, I'm using that same code to read the data out. Um, so it's, it's just nice that it's lightweight um, and it's, um, or it's fairly easy to define um, some pretty powerful things. And I like 
having a little bit of validation that's associated with uh, the models. So, um, you know, I don't get too crazy with defining uh, weird nested structures. Um, yeah, those are the things that stood out for me. Okay.